So now we taking a look at rook sacrifices. And once again, there's such a big selection to choose from that I decided in order to narrow things down to just a few examples, I decided to combine positions which I felt were educational, different types of sacrifices which surfaced time and time again and so are worth knowing, and combine that with positions that are just rather beautiful, for want of a better way of putting it. Some famous games here, a couple of them played by former world champions, Boris Paskey and Mikhail Tal. And so yeah, I hope I've struck a good balance in terms of these games, but without any further introduction, let's check them out. So here's the first example of a rook sacrifice. And we begin in this position here on move 24. And this time it was Boris Paskey, former world champion, who was on the receiving end of a sacrifice. White started with move rook to a1, and we see that even though material is roughly equal, approximately equal, they all have the same minor and major pieces, white's pieces are really much better placed, as we can see, and also he has a strong center, so black is in trouble for sure. Black played the move queen to c7, and now white brought his rook over to a7. This is very typical, just to pressure on the seventh rank, and why this particular game is very instructive is because after queen to d8, white plays rook b takes b7. And we notice that now the rook on b4, which was previously defending the pawn on e4, no longer is doing that job, so black captured. But what's very important to note is that these two rooks here on the 7th rank, one rook on the 7th is extremely strong already, but when two rooks combine on the 7th rank, they can really have a devastating effect on the opponent's position. And we see precisely this, where white begins with an initial knight sacrifice here, knight takes e5. And this is an instructive sacrifice in itself, because we notice the queen on b2 is on the a1 to h8 diagonal. And that diagonal is relatively locked by the presence of the pawns on e5, f6, and g7. The purpose of the knight sacrifice, therefore, is to blast open that cover. Black accepted the sacrifice. And here, white played what is called an intermezzo move. It's clear that at some point, white would like to capture the pawn on e5, but he begins by removing the knight on e4 instead, perhaps concerned that if queen takes e5, then at some point, this knight may be able to drop back and lock down that diagonal to some extent and allow black to defend himself up a piece. Therefore, after the move bishop takes e4, black captured, and now we see that white is able to play rook takes g7 check. The black king has only two choices, king to h8 or king to f8, but neither is good enough. If king to f8, then white would simply play rook a f7 check, king e8 only move, queen takes e5 check, and clearly it will be made next move. Black can postpone the checkmate only for one more move. Therefore, black chose to move king to h8, and here we see the typical sacrifice. White plays the move rook takes h7 check, blasting open what was left of black's kingside pawn cover. And so this first type of sacrifice that we see can be considered a sacrifice to force checkmate. It's clear that if black captures the rook, then after queen takes e5 check, king to g8, then queen g7 will be checkmate. So black went back to g8. But after the very clever rook h8 check, white forces a quick checkmate all the same. King takes rook is the only move, and after queen takes e5, the queen comes in with check, and there is nothing to be done. After king to g8, white will simply deliver checkmate on g7. So this was the first, but certainly not the last, example of sacrificing a rook 
to get a devastating attack going, or in this case, a direct checkmate. Let's move on. So here we have a position taken from a game played by uh, Mikhail Tal, who has already several of his games featured in some of the videos I have recorded. And I don't think that this will be the last game to feature of his because they're so fantastically entertaining and instructive games. Here, Tal, true to his style, attacks with the move f4, and black responds by playing the move bishop to d4. Now white continues with the move e5, and already black is in quite a bit of trouble because the knight on f6 must move, and it was defending the h7 point, and we see that this battery of the queen and bishop on c2 and d3 are striking at the black h pawn. Black played the move knight to g4, however, and we see that the rooks on d1 and h1 are aligned such that if black plays knight f2, he will be winning at least in exchange. White proceeds with his business and captures the pawn on h7. King steps to h8. And now a very, very nice move by Tal. He plays bishop back to f5, targeting the knight on g4 and inviting the knight to fork. The knight does exactly that, knight f2. And now just a brilliant move. White simply pretends like his rook on h1 isn't even there and challenges the knight on f2 and at the same time attacks the bishop on d4. How to do that? The move is bishop to e1. Just a brilliant, brilliant move. Tal allows not just one capture, but either capture. But as it turns out, black has big problems in either case. Let's see, for example, what would have happened if black had captured this rook on d1. Well, in this case, white would recapture the knight with the queen. And now a double thread has been created. The bishop on d4 is attacked, and the move queen to h5, after which king would have to step to h7, and then queen h7 would be checkmate, is being threatened. Therefore, black has no choice but to play the move g6, which covers the h5 square and also, luckily for black, attacks the bishop. If, for example, this bishop was here or on any other square, then white could capture the bishop and be up two pieces, the bishop as well as the knight on d1, just in exchange for a rook, and things would be very clear. Nonetheless, after queen takes d4, g takes f5, white now plays the move queen d3, targeting this weak pawn on f5, rook steps to e8, and now the rook would move to f1. These last few moves we've looked at are by no means forced, but they are more or less the best moves for both sides. And we can come to the conclusion that here black is in a lot of trouble, because even though white has sacrificed a rook in exchange for only a minor piece, the problem for black is that his king has no shelter. And on top of that, the pawn on f5 is very, very weak. And to add insult to injury, the bishop here on e1 can, at some point in the future, enter the game to devastating effect. Same goes for the rook on f1, which is already threatening to lift up to f3 and then target the black king. It's very unlikely that black can survive this position. So we've looked at what would happen if black had taken the let's say, the less greedy route of capturing the rook on d1, which is simply an exchange, versus the rook on h1, which would be a full rook at first sight. Of course, that's not entirely true, because after the move knight takes h1, the difference is that white has the response rook takes d4. So it's only very temporarily that black is up a full rook. However, this is the path chosen and black followed up with the move rook d8 and presumably thought okay well let's exchange one set of rooks and perhaps a move like rook takes rook and then rook takes rook and then this rook of ours will be crashing down on the d file and hopefully will give us some counterplay for the fact that our king right now is a little bit weaker than we'd like it to be in the absence of that pawn on h7 however white had a brilliant response, he played the move rook to d3, threatening to drive the rook over to h3. Rook takes d3 was played. Queen takes d3. Now the queen is on the third rank, 
looking to go to h3 followed by h7 delivering checkmate. g6 was played. Queen h3 check all the same. King to g8. And here white's attack is simply devastating in exchange for a sacrifice of a rook for a minor piece. So white is simply winning. The game continued with the move bishop to h4, although here it could be argued that the move knight to e4 would have been even stronger. A sample line would go g takes f5, knight f6 check, king g7, and queen h7 would be checkmate. And we can see just how weak the black king really is. We also see in this position, I think, some very instructive point, which is that when the rook is sacrificed over in the corner, where white sort of forgets about the rook. So one of the benefits of this is that by simply not moving the rook, you save time, right? Chess, after all, is a turn-based game. So time is extremely important. The second thing as well is that letting a knight in particular capture your rook, because a knight is a short-range piece, we see that the knight is really out of the game. In fact, this knight only points at two squares right now. And so for the time being, the knight is completely out of the game since these two squares are covered by the bishop on e1. It would be a little bit different if it was, let's say, a long-range piece like a bishop, which had captured the rook on h1. Then at least we could say that a bishop from h1, assuming, of course, that there were no pawns standing in the way, could simply drop back into the game very quickly. But one of the benefits of this particular type of sacrifice when it's a knight is that even though you've sacrificed the rook, at least the piece that has captured your rook is out of the game for the foreseeable future. And so the material deficit is not as noticeable. The game itself, by the way, continued with the move bishop to h4, f6, because here if the queen moves away then bishop to f6, with the devastating threat of queen h8 checkmate, it's game over. So f6 was played. Bishop to e6 check. King to g7. And now, very nice move, just bringing the final piece into the action. Knight to e4. And we see just crashing down on that f6 point. It's simply game over. Black did continue on for another six or so moves, five or six moves but there is nothing to be done here. The position is completely lost. But for our sake, we will stop it here and move on to the next game. In this position, black has just played the move e3 to e2 and quite clearly is threatening to capture a whole rook for nothing but a pawn. Under normal circumstances, you'd expect that white would play the move queen takes e2 which is actually a perfectly good move, or perhaps even a move like rook to f2. However, white didn't want to capture the pawn because he, in the previous move, had, if we go back, had played the move queen to d3 with aggressive intentions against the black king. And so if after queen to d3, the pawn pushes to e2 and he now captures the pawn, he will be wasting time until he can get his queen back on this b1 to h7 diagonal. And so the player with the white pieces, Boris Paskey, plays really an incredible move. He plays the move knight to d6 and offers up the rook for free. And so what's the idea? Well, the idea is that if black captures the rook, white will recapture and now we can see that there's a lot of pressure on that f7 point. And additionally, the threat is queen to h7, check. And after the king steps away, queen h8 will be checkmate. So white is willing to give up a lot of material to coordinate his pieces and to create many, many threats. It seems the computers are saying to me that if black had indeed taken and now captured the knight, that after a long series of complicated moves, it's a draw. Now, I'm not so sure how reliable the computers are. They're usually very reliable for these kind of tactics. The position, however, being so complicated and humans being human, 
Spassky's opponent, in fact, was perhaps afraid to capture the rook. And instead, in this position, he played the move knight to f8. Dealing with the threat of queen h7 with checkmate to follow. However, Spassky insisted on giving up his rook and now played the move knight takes f7. In fact, putting a second piece on pre. So now both pieces can be captured. But as it turns out, neither one is especially good for black. Well, black captured rook. White now captured rook. And here we see that white is threatening to win the black queen. And black has a few options. He can go queen to d7, queen to d5, or king takes knight. None of them are good enough. The problem is if king takes knight, for example, knight g5 check, double check, the king must step to g8, bishop b3 check, king to h8, and now white would love to give checkmate on h7, but the knight is blocking that square, so white plays rook takes knight, sacrificing his final rook, but it's good enough, rook takes f8, queen h7 is checkmate. In fact, the other options for black in this position after rook takes queen, the options of queen to d7 or queen to d5, they are also insufficient. If queen to d5, the best way to proceed is probably knight takes h6, pawn takes, and now we see the king and the queen are lined up on this diagonal. Bishop to b3 is winning black's queen. If instead queen to d7, then white jumps into the fray with the f3 knight, and all of the pieces are circling around the black king, and there is no good defense against the attack. Because of this, after rook takes, black played the move bishop to f5, queen takes f5, I know the point is that after queen d7, at least white doesn't have the move knight to e5, because then black will be able to get the queens off the board quickly, and white's attack will not be quite as strong. But after the move queen to f4, white, uh, sure enough, is still down in exchange, but he has a pawn for it. And so material-wise, he is not down too much material. The game continued on for a few moves, but in this position, after bishop to b3, it becomes very clear that the black king is not going to survive this attack. Bishop takes e5, knight takes e5 check, king to h7, and after queen e4 check, black actually resigned. The point is that if black steps the king back, then white will sacrifice his second rook. Rook takes knight on f8, queen takes, knight g6 check, king h7, and knight takes queen with a double check and mate to follow after king h8. Queen h7 will be checkmate. So this is really a quite a beautiful sacrifice, even if maybe to the machine, to the silicon eye, it's not a 100% foolproof sacrifice. But from a human perspective, if in this position, you imagine yourself as black, let's flip the screen. You imagine yourself as black and your opponent, a world champion, no less, plays the move knight to d6. Well, how would you react? Would you keep your cool in this position? I'm not so sure that I would. Flipping the board back to the winner's side once again. Well, we can say that this position is extremely complicated, but the sacrifice itself is instructive because white sacrifices in exchange for time. He trades material for time. And that's very, very important in a turn based game like chess. Okay, let us showcase one final example, and it's very different to the examples that we've seen so far. But I wanted to share it with you because it is very, very important. Let's actually show the example on the board. Here we are in a game where Black was a fellow by the name of Mikhail Botvinnik, who many will be familiar with, again, a former world champion from the USSR. And here, this particular type of rook sacrifice and exchange sacrifice is not tactical 
in nature, but rather strategic in nature. Here, black played the brilliant move rook to d4. If we notice in this position, black has a bad pawn structure. However, one of the benefits is that he has excellent control over the d4 square. So black offers up his rook for a bishop, but if white accepts the rook, then after pawn takes bishop, we see that suddenly his pawns will no longer be doubled. And additionally, this diagonal will become a little bit more accessible for pieces like the queen or in particular the bishop on b6. So this is really a very, very important idea that I'm sure you will get to use in your games, but that I see especially beginner and club players, they're not familiar enough with this particular idea, but the stronger players play it all the time. After rook to d4, white played the move knight to e2, refusing to capture with the bishop, but instead saying, okay, maybe I will capture you with the knight, which I hope is worth less in this position than this trusty dark squared bishop. Bishop went to c8, knight takes rook, pawn takes knight, bishop to f2, and now black played the move c5. And Botvinnik said of this position that white is simply left without counterplay and is therefore obligated to simply wait for what black may choose to do here. So black is playing down an exchange, but in fact has a very, very safe position. 25 or so moves later, Black was actually able to convert this into a win. But the important takeaway is that sometimes you are not going to be sacrificing your rook for a beautiful attack like in previous examples, but rather for something as positional and strategic as improving your pawn structure. So, I hope you enjoyed the selection of games here and you have a better idea now of different situations where a rook sacrifice may be in order and uh, I will see you in the next section.